discussion on coming out of the summit and taking the lessons that we've learned from the presentations today and lessons that, you know, those of us who, who weren't speaking might have to offer as well and say, what kind of things do we want to come out of the summit? What are we going to take away? What are some concrete steps, some concrete action we can take to achieve those futures that we want seven generations from now? And this can be something as specific as um, like Rick Whaley suggested, doing something to support uh, the Wampanoag out there on the Atlantic coast, or it can be something even more, I don't know, this is the kind of society, the steps we need to take to see this, this new society, maybe based on traditional knowledge type of idea. How do we get to those type of societies? Um, so I think what I'm going to do is pass the mic around and have each of you, please say your name again so we all know who you are, but tell us what, what society you envision and in a really brief nutshell, and then what are some concrete steps you think we should take today coming out of the summit to achieve, to achieve these futures. And we do have to be out of here a little bit after 5 so they can set up for tonight. They're going to be taking the tables out and all that, so they need some time to do that. So we might be a little limited, not able to do this like a true talking circle um, where everybody can talk as long as they need to. I might have to say, okay, we need to pass the talking stick. <laughs> all right. Um, maybe we should start with Lee. Um, bonjour. My name is Lee. Um, I've been thinking just a lot. Of, I'm going to be very short, um, although it's kind of hard for me to be up six foot seven. But um, you know, our people have been through this diaspora, where our people have been spread out from our original homelands, and so I've been thinking a lot about uh, living in an undiasporated state of mind. Um, that's all. Which I need to listen some more. <laughs> I'm Adriana. Uh, um, I guess I'm, I, I, I feel like the, 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 um, the frustration of the legal system and, and, and the processes that are not uh, implemented and the field consultations and so on and so forth. And I, I'm particularly encouraged by uh, the opportunities that actually Lee was talking about in terms of um, uh, asserting tribal sovereignty and jurisdiction and all of that. And uh, I want to see a lot more of that. I want to see a lot more court action and, and things in, in that direction, I think, personally. Hi. Uh, I haven't really been thinking about this <laughs> for so long. But, um, you, know, I, you know, I do believe in uh, action steps and... Um, uh, when I think of so many issues in which uh, I feel like I'm fighting against, for example, the mining issue here in, in uh, the UP, um, I, I'm kind of frustrated by the fact that we want to have a moratorium, many, you know, the Green Party and many others, and yet there are so many uh, conflicting claims by, you know, parties that would seem to be in favor of uh, a moratorium. For example, it's just come to my attention that, what is it, the Huron Mountain Club? Is that what we were talking about at, at our Green Party meeting? Yeah. The Huron Mountain Club uh, is opposed to uh, mining here in, in our region, but not for a more general moratorium. And so you get, you know, different groups with, um, you know, different interests because uh, inevitably there's always a, a corporate interest and somebody might be against having mining uh, taking place in his, uh, his or her own backyard, but not um, across uh, a wide uh, regional swath because people have their own uh, financial gain to think about. And so I just wish there was some way to push for a legal mechanism to, uh, that wouldn't make it so difficult to obtain moratoria because that is really frustrating. A long time ago, King of Spain asked one of his intellectuals why he felt it was important to impose Spanish language on native people. Nebrea was the intellectual's name, and his response was, because your majesty it is the perfect instrument of empire, legal language especially is the conveyance of that instrumentality of empire. So if we're gonna use the law as a tool, we have to be asking what law and how it's been applied 
And if we're going to use it, how we use it to our advantage. I mean, I would suggest that there is something that we can learn from the application of law to us, which is that if you see something needs to be done, you get it done, and then you create law to justify it. There's a broader law that we can rely upon to guide us. But when I hear that word come up, it means the courts of the conqueror. We won't get justice in the courts of the conqueror. We're going to have to forge it another way, redefine law. Putting um, into action the things that we've talked about today, um, I guess just on a very small just level for me is um, I once saw a PowerPoint on um, the the water, um, how how we buy plastic, um, how we buy water and then in plastic bottles. And um, it's really not healthy for us and it's really bad for the environment. And so, like, my husband and I, we just kind of, like, decided that we weren't going to buy bottled water anymore. And um, I think that's just one small step for me as an individual to help you know, take care of Mother Earth and the water and the plastic bags. I finally bought those um, recyclable bags because they always, you go to the store and they say paper or plastic, you know. And plastic is so much easier to carry, you know, but paper is, you know, I guess a little bit more environmentally safe, but it also destroys our trees. So I guess just in my little small way, that's what I would like to make a commitment to is um, using the, the the environmentally safe package packaging language. I'm Ben Yehola, and I believe that you know some of the ideas that are expressed from from everybody here is, is one that that re really adds to you know what you know how we apply that this whole the concept of, of of taking care of the environment ecology and but also it's it's how do I get the young ones to to see this how can I create something that's pleasant and, and inviting make them a big part of what we do here today but yet in a way that where where it's it's good and they accept it and perhaps even a song or, or a melody this is the way I, I, I like to work with, with my, my children. We, we make songs. We, we, build, we build from something that, you know, all, all the, some of the things that are going on, the, the degradation of earth, <clears throat> but yet we have to look forward and, and look to them and what, what we shape them to be is, is one that I, I hope that we can, it, it will be for the good for Earth. I'm Rick Whaley. Um, it's always heartening for me to come back up to the Northwoods, to Chippewa, Ottawa Territory. Good things always seem to happen. And it's especially heartening for me to hear all the activism that's still going on uh, up here. I used to come up to the boat landings during the spearfishing years, and those were quite testing and powerful days to be together with people. And that turned over into the mining struggle. So it's very, um, it's moving to me to see people have taken up the cause uh, to fight for place and they're, they're still working and to hear um, young people like Jessica and elders like our friends from the East Coast here uh, doing the work. And I think to me one of the lessons from today is that people got to work at all levels. You have to work at the grassroots level. You have to work at the tribal government level. I mean, how important it is it to have people like Lee in office with tribal sovereignty behind them saying these things that grassroots activists have been saying for years and years. So um, I think that this idea you work at all levels and you see the, the young people coming up with skills and heart uh, and doing the right kind of politics, it's, it's really um, exciting to me. And I think the theme that, um, you know, this Indian perspective uh, an and activist perspective on the land and caring for the land and right relationship 
really is leading everybody. Um, you know, I've heard people uh, say critical things about Obama, which I think are justified, but in Milwaukee, I'm an urban center. I teach on the north side. My family is interracial, black and white. There are some really good things about him in there, and he's in a dangerous position because people don't even like the small things he's been able to accomplish. But I think one of the heartening things for me about Obama is this notion that, you know, somebody could uh, claim the civil rights legacy and be bold enough to give leadership to the whole country. I think at least he's trying. And here at this conference, what I hear people saying is that, you know, Indian people who are standing up for what's right are giving leadership to the whole country. And that, that's what heartens me. Um, I'm just really grateful to be here and surrounded by everyone else who's really passionate and about doing something about for our communities and Mother Earth. Um, and I guess one vision that, um, that I would like to see is that having our communities empowered, um, lifting our communities up and lifting up Mother Earth and I think as Native people having, um, taking the lead and helping to lead society back into um, natural law and in balance with the environment. But um, yeah, we've been fighting this mine for six years now, and we've been getting pretty weary. So I'm glad Jessica <laughs> showed up, and we met her last summer for the Protect the Earth, and I'm really. I'm really excited that Jessica's in, in on this because she's got the energy of three activists, I think, <laughs> or at least three of us, tired ones. Um, but like what you said, what we can do at home. And for me, um, I just keep praying every day to the water um, spirit um, woman of the rivers, lakes, and streams and all the other spirits who are helping us and giving us the strength and they're working with us and um, and guiding us and some who have fought like Walt is that his, his spirit has come to me for a few times and um, anyway it's mainly about praying and just to keep fighting keep educating people about you know the mining companies kind of caught in that and um, what we stand to lose and um, and just to keep being crazy, like we've said. <laughs> like, I don't care about being called a rack on viral anymore. I got over that a long time ago. So <laughs> anyway, I'm just going to keep fighting. Um, I'm Teresa, and I guess one thing I've been involved in the mining issue for the last six years or so, and uh, one thing I really learned is that the corporation's greatest strength is the, are the divisions that I think that they have created, the, the boundaries and borders in our waters and our land and political parties and classes. And um, like I said, I, my family is from the Appalachian region, so we grew up with very little and moved a lot. And, you know, sometimes all we had was the land to live off of. So um, I think my vision is for people to see in communities who aren't necessarily intellectuals or have a lot of money that I think corporations often portray people as environmentalists, wealthy environmentalists or intellectuals. And um, recently I was fortunate to have my mother move in with me. She, um, and uh, to bring that bond back together again. And she only has like a sixth grade education and she just keeps saying, well, what can I do to, you know, to protect the water? And for a while it was all legal and, you know, just all of these politics and things that she couldn't really relate to or use a computer. Um, so it's been a challenge to find things to do. And I think that that's a problem. I think we need to figure out what people who, you know, people can, like you said, sing songs and, um, make dinners and do things like that. It doesn't always have to be within the frame that has been set up for us, the legal frame and the nonprofit industrial complex. And so, anyway, I guess empowering communities, like Jessica said. So, hello, I'm Holly. Um, I'm Holly Dennings, and um, I'm really 
both are grateful to be here and be able to um, make a little more regional connection. I've, I've moved a lot um, over the years and um, for a while kind of um, had connection with the Iroquois, um, sort of Six Nations communities when I was um, a kid and lived in uh, Colorado for a while, connected out there and Washington State. Um, lately my energies have been around uh, Louisiana and the Hurricane Katrina and the, the sort of connections down there with the disasters and the indigenous communities that have been hit even more um, than the communities in the, the city. And so I started to, to try and feel um, a way towards um, bridging really large divides. And in my teaching, I um, teach at the university in uh, Whitewater, and there's a lot of people who really want to know more um, about race, ethnic relations, about uh, indigenous communities. There's definitely still some, you know, serious resistance out there. But um, over and over, when I when I teach about these issues, people want to know. So I, I figure there's got to be some way of uh, really making allies and opening to people's hearts. I think that's where um, where we can really make those those changes. The legal frameworks are are huge and daunting. Um, I think that language right is is uh, is a is a big barrier. But if we can sort of write, um, I, I do writing and, and I do sometimes think it's a, a dead language <laughs> so it's been hard for me to actually get something published because it keeps evolving and changing over all the years. I never get it where it should be. Um, but I think that that can be a tool, um, whether it's a, a reflective tool, self-reflection, um, just journaling, because that can actually um, be a spiritually enlightening and, and we feel um, sort of lightened by doing that. Um, and then you can also share it with the people. And, and I'm definitely going to write right away to, uh, uh, to Salazar because this is – I lived in Massachusetts. I actually went to Boston College, so I have connections in, in New England as well. And um, somehow helping us all in these kind of circles um, is, is very um, heartening to me as well. And, and finding some old friends and new friends. Um, and so I just want to say miigwech to everyone. Thank you. My name's Doug Cornett, and I'm a, a recovering environmentalist. Um, I don't. I, um, I'm, I'm taking a break from painting the uh, kitchen, so. Um, but I've been um, working with uh, Teresa over here. Uh, and Barb, and Barb's son, Gabriel Caplet, and he put together this wonderful publication. And um, I think what the publication reflects is um, uh, I, I, I think we've done a really um, um, different, unique uh, way of presenting environmental issues. So I, I'm, I'm very um, proud of them, and um, they they use the office that I used to to raise hell from. So, um, yeah, and these kids run around in our studio space here, so um, it's very uh, very pleasing to see it. Uh, but um, I, I, I've been trying to pound the, uh, uh, the, the, the thoughts into their heads that um, really what, what conservation organizations are doing now is dreadfully boring, um, has no imagination, and has no vision. Um, and the opponents have a vision much different from our own. Um, and we need to forge something different um, and um, do something to inspire younger people. Um, I, I was um, present at the um, Captain Paul Watson talk uh, in November and here were these 
500 kids in this lake. Where did these dorky kids come from? They all had on um, kind of the black uh, rimmed glasses, and they all had straight hair falling down into their faces, and uh, you know the the blue jean uh, t-shirt kind of unisex look. Uh, but they were um, um, fans of um, who was uh, Watson's fr friend uh, Steve, um, the uh, Animal Planet guy, Steve Irwin. Yeah, and you were probably there. <laughs> were you there? No, you're not a fan of the Whale Wars. So. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, you know, this was uh, really great to see uh, someone uh, a little bit older than me uh, uh, relating to uh, these kids. And um, um, I don't know, I'm just kind of rambling now. But uh, anyway, recovering environmentalist. Uh, seeking um, some different avenues of, of media and uh, kind of a different direction of things and um, see songs and poetry and, and stories um, um, as things to um, uh, hand down to pe uh, younger people um, some of the trials and tribulations of trying to uh, um, do things to protect the environment and to go up against agencies and to be beaten down by bureaucracies and um, the uh, whole political, uh, administrative, uh, uh, judicial um, grasp that, that industry and corporations and the government have on things that uh, pound down any vision that we might have. So there, I'm going to shut up. <laughs> Bonjour. I'm Robin Candelaria, and I'm from southwestern Michigan. But um, I made this connection with Bettina and, and Chucky because... Um, I found out that I have some roots over there on the East Coast and I'm exploring those. And about the same time that I discovered that, I found out what was going on with this Cape Wind debacle. It's been uh, upsetting in a million different ways. And I uh, came here to ask them, you know, what I might do, you know, any way that they can use my services, I'd be glad to put that forth. Um, I'm a writer. I write all those dead words. Sorry about that. <laughs> but um, I kind of take it to the streets in that way. I, I go online at all hours of the morning and go after people who are saying the wrong things and um, teach them a lesson with words sometimes. <laughs> That's one way I can do that. Um, these issues are very, very important to me um, all the way around because I think they, um, they do have to do with our hearts and who we are as individuals and humans living on this earth. Um, if any of you are involved in causes that you need a writer, I don't charge for those services. I'm a counselor by day and a writer by night. So, you know, feel free to use me if you want. And uh, one thing I have I've put my family on notice that if, our Secretary of the Interior does not come down on the side that I think is the just side of this, that he's probably going to have a visitor or two. Yeah, so they wouldn't be surprised if I take off in the middle of the night. <laughs> Thank you. Miigwech. Um, my name's Amanda. Um, something I would like to see coming out of this is just a lot more cooperation between um, the people who have the power to make the changes that need to be done and the people who know uh, from being out into in the environment what needs to be done. That would, I feel, make, would make a big difference in a lot of our issues. 
Um, my name's Audrey. Uh, like, I grew up around nature and everything. My dad, when he was young, he was a farmer. My mom's always had a love for plants, so I spent a lot of time outside. And uh, I guess what I would want to see is just a lot of support, like getting the word out there, getting people involved. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that want to make a change. They just don't know where to start. So that's what I'd like to see. Well, first of all, um, I will keep my promise to Jessica that I will improve my life and what I do about this environmental problems that we have and issues. But I have to go to my natural resources department side and and expound upon what I see and what I feel. Um, I see us at a point where we're crossing a threshold where the little things that we do are going to maybe sustain us for a little while longer. But over the past few years, we have made some significant discoveries of our culture that predated anything that we knew about before that have taken us back 12 and 13,000 years. And so I don't know about Tina, but myself, it has given me the thought that the ancestors are bringing us full circle. And from that, I get that they are telling me to reach out to my youth, teach my youth the skills to take us through possibly another ice age or a catastrophe that takes away electricity and takes us back to our past, that we need to develop those skills in our children. And I see that as being our most important goal that we need to reach. My father raised us, and he told us we need to live in one sneaker and one moccasin. We need to be aware of what's going on in their world, but we also need to remember where we came from, remember the skills that we need to survive without their world, and the intelligence to be able to pass that on to our next generations. So whenever anybody asks me about what I think about providing for seven generations, I think we need to re-inspire the skills. My tribe asked me to <laughs> write a letter for my the newsletter, which I haven't had a chance to do yet, but they wanted me to entitle the letter off of the asphalt because a large part of our community is now pretty much stuck on the asphalt. They don't get into the woods. They don't get into the water. They've changed their lifestyles to adapt to what we have to do to live. I've been on a computer for two years, and I see that it draws me away from the simple things that that I used to do well. Without a computer, it, it has made me need. I know the fight that I have with my grandsons to get them off the Xbox or the Wii to take them into the woods to teach them to track. Um, I see that as the important contribution that I can make. Thank you. Next seven generations. I can try to name some of the generations now. I think how our lives have changed. I'm fortunate that there are places I can go, and if I listen, I know I'm hearing the same thing they would be hearing unless a plane goes by. Other than that, I know it's very much like what they were listening to. But seven generations from now, is that going to be possible? I don't know. And there is something very important. Um, I guess as a human being, regardless of 
of where you come from um, or, or where, where you end up, that there is a space somewhere that you can go and calm the spirit. Where you can look out and you just keep looking and you just keep looking and nothing impedes that vision. Within two generations, my home may be surrounded by these wind turbines and my heart shakes. I'm hearing all these horrendous, because I can't think of another word, minds. And what they're putting back into Mother Earth. How do you put poison into your mouth and think that's a good thing and think that she is going to continue to be able to give you what you need to live? Um, I, it, I don't know. I, because it's something that, that my mind cannot uh, doesn't have the capability to calculate. I guess maybe that's, that's the easiest way to, to say that. So how do we preserve these places? How do we prepare our children? How do we prepare our youth? Um, what I think it means is that we're all going to have to work together. Whether um, tribal, non-tribal, PhD, sixth grade, everybody has something they can offer, and we need to learn to work together. Um, like, if my job is to work with that section 106, it's not only working with, with those laws, but how can I get those laws to work with how our tribe works, how, how I get those federal agencies to understand Okay, now you're on my side. These are my experts. The, fish, the, the scientists you had doing those studies for three years talking about the fish, some of our fish don't even come back. What, 10 years sometimes? They only come through once a decade, so how can you be getting information? But the 60-year-old fisherman who's put his life on the line, going out every day making his livelihood, that's my expert bringing that information and making it real and making it acceptable, that that's the acceptable, that all of you who walk these woods and who know what's going on here because you live here and we want to continue living here. We want to be able, seven generations now, to be able to drink the water. I. I had this horrible dream that it's going to end up being like Star Trek where you have to go into a room to have a hologram to know what the earth was like. And it doesn't have to be, I, I, I don't think it has to be a great all-encompassing, you know, movement, but I think if we all do our part, our little part is going to end up making a huge, that's where the huge difference is going to be. And I think that's, you know, um, the grassroots and what people are talking about. Um, you know, we talk that we know thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago, our folks would travel. Certain people their job was to travel, and they would go a month or so, and they would meet what we consider far away. They didn't really consider it that far, but they would get together with other people. And that's how I, I look at this. Like, I've been invited a long way, but I've come to share, and I've come to be able to receive wisdom and information from people. Otherwise, I would not, would not meet. Um, very thankful. And I think that's the other thing we need to, to teach our children, that you're going to meet a lot of great people along this way. And it's 
through that mutual respect that we can sustain ourselves, not only physically, but mentally and spiritually. My name is Rachel Giuliani. Uh, my vision is all of us, wherever we're from, whatever our beliefs, really learning to walk together and to look on ourselves and each other with respect and understanding of the dignity of each person, place, thing, that place or, or being, Mother Earth included. And um, as an educator, my focus has always been um, as whatever I want my students, children to learn that I have to do myself. It's, it's one thing to just talk about it, but talk is cheap, I said a lot. And what really matters is what I do, because actions do speak much louder than words. So no amount of words that I say are going to mean anything to anybody if I'm not actually living out what I'm talking about. And all of us, whether we know it or not, are teachers. And we're teaching all the time who we are, what we think, and so forth and so on. And so even though we might think that what we say is what we're teaching our children, they're really learning by osmosis by what we're doing, because what we do shows what our priorities really are. So I have spent a lot of time on the Internet contacting Congress and about the mine and various human issues. And ultimately, I think the most important thing we can do is learn to listen to each other, respect each other, work cooperatively, and act on our beliefs knowingly. Be willing to look at myself, for example, and if I think I made a mistake, correct it and move on and be an example of how a person, no matter what's going on in the world around me, can have a healthy, happy life based on our attitude towards it. Because I think a lot of our life um, and the quality of it depends more than anything on our way of looking at it. So I'm focused more these days on rather than trying to change the world, which is really impossible, uh, it's kind of like trying to change the, the furniture on the Titanic. Um, so rather than doing that, which is going to go nowhere except sink, um, working on changing my m own mind about the world and where I really want to focus my time. So what I do, I, you know, hope to empower myself, work towards that, and assist people empowering themselves to do um, what they want to do for, to attain their own dreams. That, and I would like to see us all working together, communicating together, caring for each other, and for our, um, our home, Mother Earth. Miigwech. Um, my name is Erica Judy, and I'm a landscape painter. Um, but I, I always go outdoors for long periods of time just to... Um, and uplift my soul and I feel very connected to the outdoors um, and a few years ago I, I'm a person who always tries to find, bridge the gap between people and tries to see the, the positive way to go and try to phrase things and help people out of the, the, di the divides that people make but a few years ago I participated in or I was went to the hearing for the mine and uh, tried to talk to each side, you know, people from all the different groups that were represented in the DEQ and the mining people and the scientists. And, and after a few days of that, I was realizing how 
<laughs> what a scam it was. <laughs> and so it was a big eye-opener. So um, I do think there are certain things that you should stand up for sometimes in life. And um, as far as what you said about a vision, I th- last night I saw the, the movie The Cove, which was about the Japanese uh, killing the dolphins in this little area. One of the, the things that was really good about that movie is the man who um, kind of grouped a group together to really expose what the truth about it. Um, he, he focused on this one little tiny piece of geography and this event in there. And by focusing so carefully on this, he felt like it was a, a power point, you know, or a power place to expose other things, you know. And so it didn't all fall apart, but it was very clear and, and elegant in its understanding of the whole issue. And so I kind of am focused on this mind and the, the systems that are being used to try to understand how to think about a whole lot of issues. So if that helps anybody, I don't know. Thank you. Hello, my name is Steve, and uh, it, it's been a pleasure to be here today. I'm, I'm honored to be one of the token white guys uh, that gets to sit in and listen and learn. Um, my family, my dad's family, my mother's too, uh, were part of diaspora of their people at a time uh, many generations ago. My dad's story brought that family to North America, and my mother's took her to Australia. And it was just a crazy thing of a world war that they met, and my sister and I are result of that. I mean, world events in our past and my firm believer in our very near future are just of such great magnitude and beyond our individual ability to change. Um, But they cause our lives. And in my own personal, my own story, you know, I had great fortune, I guess, in being able to have an opportunity for living in Australia for a while when I was a kid and seeing parts of the world that most people would never get a chance to see while we traveled there and back and getting educated and getting a degree and moving to Marquette and teaching. Um, And because of the things that I know, being able to achieve um, you know, a position in the community, too, outside of the university that has allowed me to play a role in the growth of this community. Um, but eventually, hopefully in everybody's life, there comes a point where you kind of wake up from a dream, maybe into another dream, but it's just a series of awarenesses that you enter if you're able to be awake. And the past few years have been one of radical change for me. And, you know, I, I do work uh, very hard at the things that I do. Um, mostly a couple of people in the group know me from um, my connections to trying to raise the alarm about peak oil and uh, our urgent, urgent need uh, to transition into something as quickly as possible because, the you know, the the dream out there that most people are living is rapidly coming to an end. And uh, um, so I think, you know, regardless of gene pool, um, we do have to um, understand the, the absolute necessity of community and to build connections. You know, in nature, somebody, I guess, uh, maybe it was Damien earlier that said everything is somebody else's food that all goes around. Um, and that communities don't function by competition, they function by cooperation. And I believe that's the only answer. Thank you. I'm going to pass it to a couple of additions to the circle here. Um, my name's Carmen, and um, 
Originally, I just came here to observe um, this group, and I think that a common theme that I've seen here is that um, it's all about getting the next generation to know, and I think that's really important, and I agree that having a vision is very important because that's something people can connect to. So to get that attractive image out there and make them make more people follow it that in ways that help the environment. Um, I'm not from around here. I'm very new to this area. I'm from Vermont, so um, I think it, it was it was it's good to see some of the issues that are going on around here and um, you know tell other people about it and be informed myself about where I am, and um, I agree with everything that everybody said here, so that's, that's basically it. Oh. I'm John O'Brien. I am a sophomore at NMU, and um, I'm just trying to uh, live more sustainably and figure out ways that we can be more self-reliant in our own communities, and then I guess uh, trying to teach other people how to do that too. Um, I'm trying to grow food in my dorm room and <laughs> um, compost inside. <laughs> yeah, and then um, I'm trying to uh, get those things started up um, on campus on a bigger scale and then hopefully just figuring out the best way of doing things and spreading it around in new places. So. I love that, John. And that's like saying, well, you know what? I'm in the system, but I'm just going to set my own agenda and do what I need to do anyway. And that's, I really, I think that's what we need to do because we are stuck in, well, we have the system imposed on us. And the system that's imposed on us was imposed as a colonial system. And its purpose is to colonize, whether that's Native people, Indigenous people here and around the world, or it's, it's rural people, you know, with, with resources in their backyards. Um, to me, that's where my, my struggle is, is seeing that there's a lot of similarities between rural struggles to remain on the land and Native struggles to remain on the land and to protect the land. And to me, everything you guys are saying here is everything we do need to be working on. Um, we need people willing to get entangled in those systems of colonization and the way I envision it is like they're they're working maybe the lawsuits and such to hold back like the tidal wave while everybody else is trying to hurry and scramble to to get people back into the traditional lifestyles back on the land um, trying to get, reinstitute those those original ways those traditional ways of governance and so we need those people out there entangled in the colonial systems and I'm glad I'm not one of them so much to have to be in those legal systems because I really think that's difficult to deal with because they are to colonize, um, but they have to hold back that tidal wave so the rest of us can start reinvigorating those traditional life ways, whether they're traditional rural, um, traditional native, but I feel that that is where our, our salvation is going to lay. Unfortunately, I don't know how much time we have. <laughs> that's, I think, the key is I think personal working for personal change is great, uh, but we need to do this on a societal level, and we need to do it fast because we don't have a lot of time. And uh, the earth may go on, but I want human society to go on, too. <laughs> I want us to be there. Um, for sure. I know some of you have heard me say this before, but uh, I often introduce myself as um, I'm Mr. Delvar. But um, I tell people I'm from the territories currently occupied by the state of Michigan. People laugh. But I'm dead serious. I am currently from the territories occupied by the state of Michigan and parts of Canada. When I say currently, probably it's going to be that way all the time. But again, that's where the English language supports this colonial reality. It's so much easier to say I'm from Michigan. And with that becomes this whole state apparatus that's all embedded in that state or colonial reality. And to, to structurally take it apart, I have to say I am from the territories currently occupied by the state of Michigan. And I repeat that often for effect. I am from the territories currently occupied by the state of Michigan. Because I believe you have to hear it seven or eight times before you start really getting into it. But um, just a couple of quick thoughts based on some of the conversations. Um, I, my background is international law for the folks on indigenous peoples. 
one of the things I work with some communities on, this is people um, all over the world actually, but there's a legal protocol for Native people where the first thing you cite always is your own legal premise, whether it's an oral law or a written law. That's your first thing you state. The second thing that you should state is international law that supports your law. The last thing you should cite is U.S. law. Areas where it cites or supports your law and international law and where it differs from your law, that is the basis for going to an international court to adjudicate the differences between tribal and U.S. law. The problem is international courts do not recognize Native nations. Remember, there's no red people in that body. So that's a huge problem there. So I'm not a, you know, a big UN fan, but it's important to always, your first, and then I would offer my initial testimony into the court system in your own language as best you can. Let them figure it out. Because our words are completely different in meaning and substance and bring with it all kinds of different images to the table than theirs do. So uh, that would be my recommendation in terms of the law because it is, you know, it's, it's, unless you're playing on their ground, and we have to do that at times, you know. A um, couple quick thoughts. My dad voted Democratic every day of his life. But he always said to me, Lee, you remember one thing, the Democrats ain't giving you the land back either. Mr. Obama hasn't come through on that yet, has he? Um, and, and then the, I think the last thing is going to be that, um, you know, when they talk about civil rights for Native people, that's what they give you when they take away your human rights. And the first thing that you need to exercise any human right is a clean environment, water, land, and air. Without that, you have an inability to assert your human rights. And so a lot of this argument in the United States comes about these civil right issues. We have these civil rights. Well, that's, again, my belief is that's what they do. When they take, when they take your human rights away, they're trying to give you civil rights. Um, you know, they made U.S. citizens, what, back in 1924 or something? Well, you have to understand that China made the people of Tibet citizens of China. Saddam made the people of Kuwait citizens of Iraq for a reason. To give them citizenship, to deny them sovereignty in their own lands. So it's always not a positive thing when they give you something. Um, you know, they give you something with one hand, but they take away two other things. So um, I'm going to go for that minute. Thanks. Thank you, Gresh. I'm glad you added. Um, I guess I'd like to also throw it out here, too, and I'm glad we started it. Are, do our presenters have anything that they want to add in particular and say, you know, after listening to what people had to say, this is really what uh, we'd like to see people go out and do. Um, do you have specific actions people can get involved in, specific ideas or suggestions? Part of the uh, Muskogee Food Sovereignty Initiative project, we're involved on a national level regarding the foods justice for all initiative, and it's dismantling racism in the food system. And because we know what what what's been going on, especially when we look at our own tribe, we see. And I I talked about that with the USDA food freeze, and but our, it's killing us. And and, and so, but working on a on a national level, developing our our organization, it's more of a movement, and out of Milwaukee with um, Will Allen and his project, he's been able to get this racism issue in, in the, the food movement, whereas it hasn't happened until he, he made the move. And so we've been actively engaged in, in, in plan, planning for, for the September it's the International Urban Ag Conference here in Milwaukee, second week of September. But we're going to piggyback on that with our Going Food Justice for All initiative. But it's something that if you look, look, Google it, you'll find you know some activity in that. And so for us to continue working healthy for a cause, then we need to take care of ourselves and our children. I wanted to add that so you, the others, if you want to look for something to do, that's one. You always have got to have good food. GFJI. If you Google that, you'll find that, but it's Going Food Justice for All Initiative.
I guess um, I would just add, um, encourage everyone to, to follow your heart and um, I think the answers are all in our heart and just um, like whatever dream you have, it's attainable. If you have a dream for, you know, to revitalize your language and culture or whatever it is, I think as long as you believe in that and you, you follow that and stay true to that. So that would just be my advice. So go for it, whatever your dream is. And I'm not a presenter, but can we get a sense of the group that we are? I guess so. 